almost have. Welcome, everybody, to the Norman Rockwell Museum. Uh, my name is Mary Burley. I'm the chief educator here, and it is a, an, a terrific pleasure to welcome Jerry Pinckney and his wife, Gloria, back to the museum. Uh, Jerry, and Pinkney, Jerry and Gloria are an incredible team and with deep connections to our museum. Um, There's, there's so much to say, and I actually am only going to say a few things so we can get right to it. You're not at all. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Jerry was the Norman Rockwell Museum Illustrator Laureate in 2016 and 17. Uh, during that time, I was the principal at Muddy Brook Elementary School, and Jerry came to our school two years in a row and met with every third grader to talk about his personal story and to inspire kids to persevere in life. Uh, he is a living example of the American dream in a way that is also, uh, it's bigger than the American dream because of the extraordinary contributions you've made while you've also been, um, uh, been taking care of your family in extraordinary ways. Jerry has made over a hundred books. Uh, he's won the field's highest honor. He's a Caldecott Award winner for the Lion and the Mouse, and something to know about that book is that the lion is Jerry's self-portrait. <laughs> so, <laughs> and we learned that at Muddy Brook, and the kids just love that so much. Um, so, uh, Jerry is a treasure in our community. Uh, he's a national treasure. And today, uh, the book that he's speaking about, A Place to Land, could not be more timely. Uh, it's the only book of its kind which tells us about uh, the five days leading up to Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech and is a tremendous contribution to classrooms and families um, all over the country now and, and into the future and the world. So, Jerry, thank you for being here. And uh, Jerry's been married to his wife, Gloria, for 60 years as of this March. <laughs> Gloria is also with us. And we will, um, we will have a presentation. And then following that, we'll sing with Gloria's uh, leadership. Uh, one song, and then we'll go into questions and answers. And um, and again, on behalf of the entire staff of the museum, we're so happy that you're here, and I anticipate that we'll have a wonderful conversation after learning more about Jerry's uh, process for making this incredible book. Well, how are you? Um, it's good to be back, and um, this time, and I've, I've, you know, some of the, you might remember, I've been here a number of times in this room, I think the first time, I was doing a presentation on a book of children's uh, book illustration, it was a group show, and I was invited to speak here. Um, and so I've been back a number of times, but this is the first time they brought me in through the the back entrance, and that made me feel like I was now part of the Rockwell. Um, so I passed all these signs that said staff only, and I said, whoa, this feels good. This is feels good. So um, I can't tell you how excited I am about um, this new project. Uh, it was published uh, in, and uh, released in August. Um, but I want to tell a little story there, and is that um, uh, I grew up um, in Philadelphia, and then from Philadelphia to 60, to in the 60s to Boston, and so the civil rights movement was certainly in full uh, swing at that time. Um, and I, I joined a Boston Action Group, which was a, sort of um, an activist group, um, and we were. Um, in the forefront in Boston at the time of um, um, housing and um, and circle and certainly equal employment um, and um, most importantly I think was um, voter registration uh, that was really when you were dealing uh, with folks in the community and how important that was 
Uh, so that the civil rights movement was always a part of who I became during that time. Um, and I had opportunities to actually illustrate projects that where the subject matter was the civil rights movement. And, um, but I tended to shy away and not look for those projects. I felt strongly that, uh, one, it was so well documented in terms of photography. And, um, and the energy, I didn't think that I could capture the energy of the 60s. Um, not only the marchers, and, and, um, um, but also the music that was generated. So I kind of pushed back on projects that, um, um, that celebrated and spoke to that time period. Um, I also pushed back on portraits of the people that were instrumental, the spearheads. And certainly um, one was uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, I wish I can remember the date, but I was approached by the U.S. Postal Service to do the Black Heritage Series. And one of the stamps, those commemorative stamps, was on Dr. Martin Luther King. And I did a portrait. I did a portrait. Am I happy with that portrait? Um, not so. Um, I think a lot of it still was in my head, this sense of his, uh, he's an iconic person. Um, and I never felt that I could do justice to the poetry and the importance of what he was trying to say and what he was trying to do. So I'm going to jump ahead to being approached uh, by Neil Porter of Holiday House. Um, I had completed another project with Neil uh, in plain sight at another publishing house. He moved to Holiday House. And uh, in conversation, he mentioned um, he had that manuscript. And um, did I know anyone that <laughs> could do portraits well? And, and I'm, I don't know what that bridge was that asked, well, could I, could I see the text? Could I see the manuscript? And, um, but it, that happened, and I immediately uh, felt drawn to it and, and, and pulled into it because there was that aspect of a place to land where Mahalia Jackson, during when he's delivering the speech, I hope I'm not jumping ahead too far, um, <clears throat> suggests that they add, that he add that statement and I have a dream. That was something I was new to me, and so that was the that was the the door, the window that allowed me into the text. So I didn't, and I didn't realize that a lot of people knew it, by the way, uh, that some people did. But that was the bridge. Um, and then I had to figure out now um, how do I now um, take the energy and my experience of 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 being that little part I played in the civil rights movement, but mostly the, um, the folks who came back from the marches and um, demonstrations in the South who would return to Boston and we would have meetings, the Boston Action Group, and I, we would listen to what they had to say. So what I thought I'd do this afternoon is briefly introduce a little bit about myself, where I came from, because I grew up, I was born in 1939 in Philadelphia, which was uh, de facto segregated. I went to an all-black elementary school. So what the other, you know, I think about my work and I think about the projects that I take on, that it's little pieces or pockets of energy and experiences that inform my my work. Um, so I'll, I'll speak about that through a slide presentation as well. Um, 
So we'll start. Oh, there's one thing, because I, I, I touched upon that being introduced to the text by Barry Wittenstein. And by the way, um, there would be no uh, a place to land without the, that stepping stone and, and the kind of um, uh, the way and the manner in which Barry Wittenstein wrote the text. Um, somebody mentioned uh, that in one of the reviews had the cadence of, of a preacher, and, and I think that also reflects. So there was a lot of pulls there. Um, I studied design, um, came to narrative art a little later. Um, so, and I've been doing it since 1960. It, through the studies and, and the continued studying -ing of, of how to make pictures, there are a couple elements that we, those of us who in the group that make art, realize it's about color, about form, about line, it's about composition, it's about all those things. So, so 60 years I've sort of focused on how to perfect my artistic practice by growing and improving on those ways of make, pic, making pictures. I knew with the place of the land, that had to be pushed to the back burner. In other words, if I was going to do justice to the importance and the energy of that time, I couldn't think as much about making desirable pictures. It had to be that the lead had to be the subject. Um, now, there's no question that I knew it was going to come up. I mean, it had to be. It was part of my DNA. But it wasn't, that's what it, it wasn't about that. It was to honor Dr. King. It was to honor the text. Um, and however that would come out, would shake out. Um, so you'll find that and you'll see the drawings um, are a little looser. Um, the more immediate, more urgency. Um, I looked back and my process is step by step by step by step. There are no step by step by steps in a place to land. There were thumbnails, working drawings, and then I had to experience um, what I was trying to say as I was making it. In other words, I believed during that time that the belief in what Dr. Martin Luther King, his message, and the people who surrounded him and the marchers, the art had to live up to what they had hoped for. So anyway, I want to talk a little bit and start with um, a little bit of background because I thought that, as I mentioned, um, okay, I grew up in Philadelphia. I was born in 1939 at 51 East Earlham Street. Uh, <laughs> there was, um, that. by the way, the house is not much larger than what you see on the screen. Uh, there were six rooms. There were eight of us, mom and dad, and uh, eight children. Um, six. Uh, six children. Thank you. <laughs> Gloria, Gloria not only sings, but she also, she <laughs> if you see me looking over at times, I'm just checking in. Um, so, well, it's actually, it seemed like eight. Yeah. But, uh, and I was the middle child, but um, there was, um, it was six rooms, and uh, uh, one bath without a sink. It was kind of crazy. And, um, but my, that was my first studio that happened in that house. It was a corner in the bedroom that I shared with my older brothers. So that's um, my, the whole street was one, one block. And I, I hope some of you are, don't remember I told the story before, but that's okay. It's part of my, that's a part of my back story. But that's my grandfather, Charles. Um, and um, it was a dead end street, and um, all of the families on that block on Earlham Street um, migrated from the south, so they brought with them the uh, um, uh, the southern culture. Um, we were a little island. If you exited um, Earlham Street, there was a Jewish uh, community on one side, and then there was an Italian community on the others. Other side, um, we got along certainly very well, but there was no so socialization at all. I went to an all-black elementary school. Um, this is the um, Earlham Street. 
Um, and that was a Ford Woody, which um, really, um, my father, my mother and my father, you can see, um, there was this sense of style. And I, I think, um, when I think back at um, my years growing up and being told that there were places you couldn't visit or certain things you couldn't do, um, uh, limitations, they, those limitations were broken down by my mother and father who, as you can see, presented a, um, uh, with great style, a, a, um, an attitude and a belief um, in themselves, and I think they, he, they certainly they instilled that in their children. Uh, that's me at 13, um, and that's Sonny, my best friend. Um, he made me feel tall. Uh, <laughs> and that's in front of Earl Ham Street. And um, the two go together, these photographs go together. I drew from a very early age, and the boys were encouraged to draw, uh, largely in part, we think now, that um, the parents wanted to keep the boys occupied and out of mischief. So they promoted this idea of drawing. Now, I have to say, there were no artists in my family, no artists in my neighborhood, no visits to museums, no visits to the galleries, but, um, but there was this attention to trying to keep us occupied in a very positive way. Um, now, I also talk a lot now about mentors, and this is what my first mentor, because he was my boss. I started um, selling newspapers at a very busy, busy intersection in Germantown section, and Matt was my boss. And um, I would take a drawing pad and pencils with me to work. And um, in between selling newspapers, I would draw people waiting for the bus to, or the trolley, or there was a department store, Rowles. I'm still trying to figure out, I don't think I could get into Rowles. I don't think I was welcome in Rowles at that point. But I drew there the windows. I used them as like um, still life, rotating still lifes. Now, why is Matt there? Well, Matt was important because I would, when things were slow, probably sometimes when they weren't so slow, you would look, my boss on the other corner would look over and Jerry, who he hired to sell newspaper papers, was sitting on the shelf of the newsstand drawing. <laughs> Matt never said a word. He understood and encouraged me in that way without saying a word. Uh, this is where also I met my, uh, my, the first professional artist, John Liney, who was the cartoonist of Henry at the time. And um, John invited me up to the studio. He would buy a paper from me and took note of me drawing, invited me up to the studio. So that was my first experience as a um, uh, with a professional artist and in, in that kind of space. And um, I, I say it laughingly that after I left, I did cartwheels because of this exposure. I doubt that it happened that way, but it had to be that that seed of possibility was planted that day, that I could see that by making pictures, you could actually make a living. You could provide for a family, and that's what John Liney did with his cartoons. The other piece of it is that, you know, actually the newspapers I sold, uh, you would have his syndicated cartoons running in that paper. So I don't know whether those, all those things make, uh, uh, you know, the fact that I'm in uh, uh, a, uh, an art form that is to be reproduced. And my first exposure to <laughs> professional artists was someone who did that. So, okay, I'm standing too long on um, John Liney, but um, uh, another mentor and a hero of mine, of course, was uh, John Henry. Uh, this is the legend of John Henry and, and um, brings me into um, those first early stories. Um, certainly, they were mostly told. Uh, they were not in print form, and certainly John Le um, John Henry was one of those stories. And as a kid growing up, I needed a black hero. And um, so J John Henry became that hero uh, for me. And um, I guess as 89, I had the opportunity uh, with working with uh, Julius Lester uh, to uh, actually um, adapt that, that folktale. So that's the, the um, 
cover of John Henry. I spoke about earlier not as a child growing up, a family that didn't attend museums or visit museums or galleries. Um, I was 18, my first uh, um, a visit to a, a museum. I was at the Philadelphia Museum School of Art and we went there for a class uh, trip. Um, this is going somewhere, believe me. Um, <laughs> um, last night, Stephanie Plunkett asked me, you know, what was that first visit to a museum like? And I realized I hadn't thought about it. And then, so, so I, I paused a moment and then I said to her, I felt incredibly comfortable um, in this new space. Um, and then I said to her, that probably makes more sense, that maybe what it was that, what it, the feeling was that I was a curious child. I did want to venture out of my own space into other spaces. Maybe the fact that I was, the, the, curi the fact that I was satisfying a part of my curiosity that made me feel comfortable. That this was something presented to me that was new. And um, anyway, now the Philadelphia Museum of Art, this all relates, um, that's in their permanent collection. So as a kid, my first museum visit was the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Uh, and uh, just about three or four years ago, they purchased this uh, image for their, um, that collection, permanent collection. Um, as I said growing up, the stories were really um, stories of um, uh, mostly told in the oral southern tradition and the tales of Uncle Remus. Uh, all of my stories and my works come from, or I hoped to find that experience that uh, has had some impact uh, or pull uh, or uh, remains in my imagination in all of the works. Um, this was uh, God Bless the Child, and this is really young Jerry as a wanderer and um, uh, an interest seeker. And um, this is um, an experience of my, because a lot of my nature, even though I'm not sharing it to, with you today, a lot of my work deals with nature and my experiences um, with visiting uh, my family that built a home out on a farm in New Jersey. Um, this was, I just told, a, I didn't tell, it wasn't a fib, but it was a, not really the truth. <laughs> I did do, uh, this was during the 1970s. Um, I did a series of calendars for Seagram's, 1974, nine, portrait 73. And um, it was, I think, 12 um, people were, were, that were figureheads in the civil rights movement. And I did this painting in 1974. And then recently, I went back to it. I never thought it was successful. And I began to play with it. And so, um, so there were, a number of, um, well, this is the second or first time opportunity to do an image um, with um, Dr. Martin Luther King as subject. Okay. Um, <clears throat> a Place to Land by Barry Wittenstein. And um, uh, let me just read a couple pages because I think that's a good way to open. And keep thinking about that earlier story. Um, where this effort to push back image making as I knew it, to push myself and force myself into another space where the sub subject matter dominated. Um, and, I, and, there, and Barry's text provided me also with that sort of urgency or like it was happening now as you hold the book in your hand. Um, Martin Luther King Jr. Once, was once asked if the hardest part of preaching was knowing where to begin. No, he said, the hardest part is knowing where to end. 
It's terrible to be circling up there without a place to land. But on August 27th, the night before the 1963 March on Washington, the strong and steady voice of the civil rights movement wasn't sure what to say or how to say it. So Martin did what great men do. He asked for guidance, not from above, at least not at first. In the lobby of the Willard Hotel, where Abraham Lincoln once stood, a meeting of minds took place. You have to preach, said Reverend Ralph Albanaki. Most of the folks coming here tomorrow are coming to hear you preach. Wyatt T. Walker agreed, but added, don't use the lines, I have a dream. <laughs> You've used it too many times already. Brian Rustin, who organized the march, wanted to hear about jobs, jobs and more jobs, not dreams or scripture. Clarence Jones, one of Martin's speechwriters, and then Barry puts in parenthesis, yes, even Martin had speechwriters, suggested a marvelous metaphor, a fresh metaphor one never heard before a bad check. It meant the time had come for America to make good on her promises of equal equality and pay up. For her citizens of color had grown weary, frustrated and angry for justice long overdue. Reverend Walter Flartnoy agreed, whatever you do, he said, keep that in there. So um, imagine me for the first time reading that text. And the text invites you in and also teases you that in a way you're learning something new. Um, so in terms of, is that going to stay there? Uh, the visuals. <laughs> um, um, now, I just said to you that there was very little sketching. The cover um, really needed, it was necessary to figure that out. Um, so this is a um, pencil a sketch uh, for the cover and back cover. Now, what you'll notice when we get into the, uh, oh, this is the cover. This is the cover. And um, I'm going to comment on some of the, you know, the process and some of the thinking. Um, in this case, uh, you know, I wanted the, uh, the I mean, the, the fact that he was a preacher uh, termed, um, you know, civil rights spearhead. I wanted to suggest the, his, his beginnings, his roots and, and, and as a preacher. And um, so I, um, I wanted to include a stained glass run, window from, you know, Ebenezer Baptist Church. And um, so what I did was I couldn't find it. I couldn't find it. Um, and then I watched films. I did a lot of watching films. And, and I, I did a screenshot of a window um, in the church. And so part of that is actually a collage. And part of it is actually art. And I wanted to fold them in, you know, blend them and knit them together. Um, now, this is the, uh, again, this is the beginning of a, a, of a drawing. Um, I, there was a preliminary drawing ahead of this, but this is where I'm beginning. I thought about, uh, you know, you'll use, you see the, the use of collage and, and drawing. And I was look, thinking about how do I, you know, how do I talk about the places that, um, where the Marsh, the Mall, the Bullard Hotel, um, they were actually places that still exist. And then if one is in Washington, you could stop and still visit those places. So I knew I wanted to use, you know, collage. I wanted to, to, to represent those places as real places. And so, but I wanted them also be a part of, of the drawing that, that just sort of, um, uh, uh, the, by the way, the drawing was a result of wanting to, to bring a certain urgency, immediacy, almost as if I'm sketching these drawings, um, not enough time, 
uh, although almost like it's unfolding in front of me. Um, so um, I started to use collage over the pencil. And again, there was very little preliminary work, but it had to be me figuring it out as I went along. That's the finished piece there. Uh, still keeping it open, and the courtroom artist who I've uh, long uh, looked at in one way or another and thought, oh, some of them work, some of them didn't work, none of them really impressed me as uh, always as art, but at the same time, the, the artist's role in a courtroom was to capture the moment. And my role in A Place to the Land was to capture the moment. And there again, pushing aside or in the back burner uh, those uh, practices, artistic practices, that has gotten me the success that I had. Now, what's interesting about this is that I said I'm not making art. One of the biggest comments that I get in the reviews is about the art, which is, brings on me a whole nother, we can have that discussion. What is art? Um, <laughs> I mean, it wasn't picture making the way I was aiming for to make art in this case, um, yet it, it, it perhaps was the subject and the intensity and the energy that I had in to invest that makes it art. Um, this is the opening um, a title page where I wanted to um, introduce people to um, the places. And so um, it happens in, in, in um, the Willard Hotel and then it happens on the um, National Mall. Uh, this is a, a work in progress. Um, and there you see me um, um, starting to add, and I just float those um, images um, from, this was from, the, um, from a film, uh, a screenshot. And um, I never know where the place is gonna f finally land. It's a matter of, of, of committing to this feels right, and you glue it down. Um, the other piece is I've done this before, where I've actually cut with scissors or, or X-Acto blade. Why I decided just to tear these images, these photographs, I still don't know. But it, it, it never came to, at all to mind that I could cut images. Um, my thinking maybe is that I wanted to have a softer, more integrated kind of look, but anyway, that's a finished drawing. And then I started matching, like if there's a podium at, um, you don't call a podium in the church, Gloria, what's a? A lectern. Okay, a lectern. No? The lectern is on one side. I'm a preacher. <laughs> oh, well, this is perfect. Tell me about the pulpit. The pulpit. pulpit. All right. In this case, matching the microphones on the pulpit. Thank you. Um, I got two kind of people in here in front of me guiding me through this. <laughs> How can I go wrong? It's not, and prayer. And prayer. <laughs> um, so that's, that's, you see that, but again, the courtrooms, this sense of, of, of feeling, I'm, I'm trying to capture a moment, and that's the big thing. Um, and then you can see where the design practice comes into play with matching, um, of being the, the search for uh, uh, other elements to support um, what I was doing. That's my floorboard uh, in my studio, as a matter of fact, um, that suggests wood texture and things like that. And um, one of the things that um, was challenging, and it seemed just so exciting in the very beginning to take on this project, until I realized how many portraits I had to do. And then that was another story. Um, I did know that if I was gonna add something to this big story, um, it had to be that what you couldn't find in a photograph and that was the interacting um, with one another. Uh, and that process was extensive. It went like starting out with a rough sketch of the composition, 
where I knew exactly where I wanted the folks to be. And then I would find a photograph that came close, a profile, a three-quarter. And then I had to articulate the photograph, what I wanted to say, how they interacted. Um, that was the challenge. And what is beautiful about a challenge is that if you can feel comfortable with not being so comfortable, you know it's going to lead you someplace else, someplace that you've never been before. And, and so that's what you see um, uh, happening here. Um, there also were, were photographs of them as they were older men and not younger men. So I had to, uh, at, at times, um, to think about that. Um, and, um, and then you'll see this uh, torn paper. Um, some people m might think it suggests the interior. That was the idea. It's not from the Willard Hotel, but it is from an a, um, a, um, interior design book from 1950s and 60s. <clears throat> but I wanted, uh, I didn't feel that um, having a background uh, seemed to me would get in the way of, of, of what I was trying to say. Um, so I thought, but I wanted you to know that there was an inside and an outside. So I thought by tearing this, this pattern wallpaper, so whenever you see the wallpaper, you know you're inside. Um, I, again, um, here, um, these are photographs from the Willard Hotel during the 1950s and 60s. And um, I used the chairs that were in those photographs. So I wanted you to, in a sense, balance the real with you know, what I had to uh, certainly invent. Um, this deserves to be read, this spread. There's always a spread that anchors me. Upstairs, upstairs alone in his suite, surrounded by rough drafts and scribbled notes on yellow legal pads, Martin saw Rosa, Fanny Lou, Emmett, Edgar, and the children of Birmingham, and so many others. Their faces forever seared into his memory. Heroes all chased by snarling police dogs, knocked off their feet by high-pressured water jets, arrested, beaten, shot, and hung, shocked and poked by cattle prongs. Their home schools and churches burned and bombed. Um, Martin was carrying, Dr. King was carrying all of that on his shoulders. Um, what did start to happen to me as the creator of this image is I was beginning to somewhat get in touch with the weight he was carrying. Um, this kind of talks about it, this image. And then I thought about the martyrs during that time. So that one to third row, you'll see martyrs, people that were killed during that time and their eyes were closed. So it was um, kind of a way of visually speaking to the loss of life during that time. Um, and I wanted to include those with those uh, folks that were, again, uh, the instrument of, 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 of change and of trying to make change. Um, so that's the drawing. And I had to do them as drawings. The finished art had to, I had to invest in the drawings and then the collage would follow. But that was a way of drawing gets you into space. You know, it, it, it kind of helps you understand things. It helps me and it puts things in perspective for me. So even though the drawings at times, the subject could be painful.
the act of drawing itself is my safety net. There's a finished image. Yeah. Again, what's interesting is um, uh, the, the yellow legal pads. I actually do all my sketching. I've always done my sketching on yellow legal pads. Um, in this case, he, um, that's Whitney Moore Young. This is inside of the um, hotel room, and he goes up late at night, and he starts to preparing the remarks. Um, and um, I was also searching for, I was searching for a way, since we're talking about a picture book with the predominant audience would be children, I was trying to think of a way um, to add children. And I worked, you know, I kept thinking about this, and I couldn't find, I, I, it wasn't, it never, it never felt like appropriate to use kids as because I want, just wanted to, because the audience were children. I never felt right with me, with me there. And so, and this, then I, looking at books, I, and I came across this photograph of this young boy, um, you know, and it's been altered, but selling newspapers, it's, it's pouring in. And I thought, ah, you know, there, here we are. This is a way of including um, children in, in, the, in the visuals uh, for this project without forcing it. This is, was a, a natural, this, this happened. Um, um, again, there's a, here juxtaposing, uh, juxtaposing the uh, image of the marchers and the army that was there. Um, JFK <clears throat> was afraid of, of, of some sort of violence. Um, so there were army uh, national guards there patrolling the streets. At the same time, um, you had this jubilant, boisterous, energetic uh, group of people there to, um, uh, to um, mark this um, occasion, um, 250,000 people. Um, the other piece was I, as I, you know, I started this project, but the sense of really, um, this was a project for me. <clears throat> it took a year to do this project. And part of it was trying to put in perspective uh, not only what the text was suggesting, but my own, my own experience and the experience we live in today. So midway through this project, I began to ask myself the question is, could these remarks be given today? And I, of course, I landed on the side of yes. And that kind of threw me in a way that I didn't expect going in. That, um, and that's when I began to start thinking that we could push this further, as you'll see in, in the ending. Um, and then through the process of research, of looking at films, um, I would let certain aspects f flow out into the book. And one, and there were a couple pictures, and I'll talk about them, but the one was um, after he was, um, he was shot that first time, there's a photograph of him um, in, in the front of a march a group of demonstrators, and he ducks because there's um, a backfiring. <clears throat> Vulnerability, I thought. Vulnerability. That this iconic <clears throat> preacher, orator, was also vulnerable. And so the image on your left speaks about that. It tries to portray, portray the weight. Um, and then, of course, on the other side, <clears throat> excuse me, I need some water. Um, got it. Um, on the other side, he doesn't know that the mall is beginning to fill. Oh, that's good. Um, And um, this is when he starts uh, to, um, to his, deliver his remarks. And um, you see the attempt to, to speak about, he was speaking at the Lincoln Memorial. Um, and he's, so what we have is the Declaration of, 
of independence and, and those kinds of things um, become important to his message because his message is about the history of this country um, and that this is at the moment uh, where he's delivering, he prepares these remarks, he's satisfied, and he's down to delivering them, but they're not getting the response he hopes for or what he would like to see happening for himself. Um, now, how Mahalia Jackson knew and understood that moment, um, I don't know, and we don't know, but we know that she says, tell him about the dream. Martin, tell him about the dream. And he pushes the um, uh, remarks aside. Uh, and as uh, Barry says, he goes to church. <laughs> so here's the thing. I'm, did I know that I had to have all these people look like themselves? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know if in the beginning, if I had you know, examined it that closely, what I've just said, you know, Neil, I do know somebody that could do it other than me. <laughs> um, but the other thing is, and these are the kind of things that keep the energy going for me. If you look, and this is from a photograph, we had to get permission, even though I altered it quite a bit, that there half of the group is looking at uh, Dr. King and the other half is looking at Mahalia Jackson. That's when I knew I could offer something up. That's when I knew I could, that photograph that exists, I could bring that photograph to life in a way that um, couldn't happen any other than the fact that my need to have this interaction, uh, to have you enter into that space. Um, <clears throat> this is a, an image of uh, where he, you know, Barry talks about uh, the, his father, his grandfather, and his great-grandfather. Um, he brings that sort of together and um, is now that he's going to church, uh, in a sense. Um, and um, here in the book, can I, um, Barry, can you just show him that bread? Because... Um, it was a designer who knew that we wanted to put some emphasis on I have, the, I have a dream, those words. So, um, and I knew I wanted to talk about the numbers of, of people. So here's what we, we did that with the, the text. So that's, you know, collaborating with Barry. Um, you know, we have their editor and then you have um, the art director all lending um, to this project in a beautiful way. Here's, a, um, a, a, again, um, an image that I was starting in, in process here. And um, is this where I spell the word integration wrong? I did somewhere. Anyway, I think I did, but we corrected it. Um, <laughs> but, oh, this is good because, you, you know, this shows, shows you, you see how I'm floating the... Um, um, the um, collage elements, are, are, and, and again, what I found about collage, which is different than watercolor, where there's a process that I know, um, I'm, I'm actually very active in, you know, in, in the art itself. And um, uh, it's like a kind of call and response kind of a way. Um, and you'll see the kind of decision making, um, and that's a finished art. Um, you also see uh, in this um, search for a sense of um, light, sense of hope, um, I began to start using the um, rainbow, um, and you'll see it. You'll see it reflected in some of the, uh, in a closer look after you buy the book and you'll have time. <laughs> 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 you'll, you'll find kind of uses of, of, the, of that in there. Uh, and here is uh, just speaking to uh, the coming together um, of um, all the uh, folks. Uh, so it's all inclusive. This came from um, my editor, Neil Porter, who felt that was essential. I didn't have this originally. But he, he, we needed a way of bringing everyone together. 
Um, so you can see how the subject and uh, everyone is involved with now uh, the, what kind of story we're trying to tell. And that's where um, uh, he meets uh, JFK um, in the Oval Office. And um, uh, he says, I have a dream to Dr. King. And there was, to me, um, an importance uh, to also extending this book, um, but also here, this is celebratory, after they leave the White House. And um, they go back to the Willard Hotel. And the image that came to mind, remember the image of the, the um, pillow fight in a hotel room? And so you see all these, you know, these things playing out. So I wanted to show them in a jubilant, playful way. I mean, after all this, um, and after the demonstration or <clears throat> what they did the event before the pillow fight, they had this way of coming back around. Um, Gloria is using the word, and um, we're now using the word human uh, <clears throat> more. Um, and this was the human thing. And so in the back of my mind, when I'm doing composing this picture, I'm thinking about that pillow fight and how they could be playful, how that might respond, how they might respond to the success of the march. Um, you're wondering, and nobody's asked, why? <clears throat> you're not wondering? You're just <laughs> um, this picture, which has nothing to do with the march that day to Washington, I came across it, and, um, and like a lot of pictures that are on the fringes of what the subject and topic is, I pushed it aside, tucked it away, um, and that's what it, that was it. And then it kept bouncing back, it kept coming back in the forefront. And so I said, well, why the Hawaiian lays? Well, this turns out to be the beginnings of the successful uh, crossing of the Pettus Bridge. And um, on a number of occasions, Martin Luther King and the marchers would wear Hawaiian lays. So I looked that up, and it's the symbol of love. So now I had that kind of that thing that I so personally needed um, was this sense of, of light. Now I had to find ways to use it, to the reader to understand and pull you into this place of light and hope. Um, so we developed this. This is the sketch, uh, two sketches. And then the finished art. Um, and the idea here was that there was progress made because there was setbacks after the march, and then there was Bloody Sunday, the Pettus Bridge. But I was trying to find a way to talk about um, this also need for us to stay in the fight. So we project beyond the march itself. And, um, and then, as a closing, I knew that no matter what our thinking, what my thinking was at the time of the success of the remarks and what he had hoped for, there's no denying that you can't get away that we elected a first black president. So it sort of brings it home. That's the, the arc of hope the arc of possibility, um, the arc of, of energy for us to stay in the fight. So, and then there's um, Shirley Chisholm and uh, John Lewis, um, but yeah, I wanted to show that arc of the continuance of the fight and the effort, and um, that's a back cover. Um, and we did BEA, BEA in Washington, and we went and we had this really wonderful breakfast at the Willard Hotel. I mean, full circle in, in so many beautiful ways. 
Um, and this last slide, this is the lay, and I didn't realize, I took this shot, they were, this is the way the tables were set up before the food was served. And I took this photograph, and yet it's, and uh, looking back now, and, and such a powerful, powerful ending uh, to this. And I think that's it. So, Gloria Jean, uh, we're going to just... <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. We're gonna we're gonna break and Gloria Jean um, is gonna come up front and then um, this is is because we're gonna hear her. She's got a great voice, but it's also to give you a chance to think about questions. And I just wanted to invite any children that want to come sit up front. Um, we've had the most well-behaved children in the yeah in, okay. on the planet. Uh, so we have if you want to stay, we have camp stools and you could be on the front. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Right. When Israel was in Egypt land, let my people go. Oppressed so hard they could not stand, let my people go. Go down, Moses, way down in Egypt land. Tell old Pharaoh, let my people go. The Lord told Moses what to do. Let my people go. To lead the Hebrew children through, let my people go. Go down, Moses, way down in Egypt land. Tell old Pharaoh, let my people go. Now Pharaoh thought that he'd go across, let my people go. But Pharaoh and his hosts were lost, let my people go. Go down, Moses, way down in Egypt land, tell old Pharaoh, let my people go. Thank you. 